Welcome to Beer Net Radio. Listen to on every continent except Antarctica. B double E double E R R N E T N E T Beer. Beer Net Radio. We like to yeah. keep it real, guys. Real and raw. No, 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 absolutely. In the past, I, I, I've had Nick join, but we have literally nine different SKUs under production this week, so he yeah. is swamped. Man. Well, well, so tell us. Tell us the latest. What's what's the hot goss, as they say? I learned that new thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I was just thinking about, like, man, it, it feels like it's been ages since we connected, but I think it was, it was only March, right? It was yeah. March, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you were down here in uh, Texas, and uh, we did a uh, – y'all were rolling out, and we, it, we you invited us to a nice little reception there downtown and uh, at Elsewhere, and uh, yeah, we, we, had a, we had a great time. No, I'm so glad you guys came through. We got to meet in person. I guess we, we met at a, a Brewbound conference, but it was just fun to meet the team, and I was just telling Jen, you know, that week we almost just canceled the whole trip because that was – we were leaving Wednesday morning, and Tuesday was the Uvalde shooting – and we had, you know, a whole trip planned through, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and and Houston. And we just didn't feel it would be responsible to be throwing these, you know, parties and 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 bringing attention to the brand, you know, letting everyone know we've launched the full state of Texas. But instead of kind of canceling and people having kind of a bummer email to open up that that we won't be coming through we just turned the whole trip into a fundraising opportunity so we raised just shy of like 25 grand you know through you know each city we went we asked people to you know donate what they could we we donated all ticket sales um and it it allowed us to kind of um turn you know a, a tragic kind of moment where we weren't sure what to do into doing something good um that, that's great that's great my uh, fiance millicent is from her family's from Uvalde and uh, it's just been tough down there. But uh, yeah, I was, I was glad that y'all continued through and uh, that was real nice and, and, a, and a great cause. Yeah. Um, as a very digital first brand, we're always very, we kind of second guess ourselves sometimes because there's always backlash on, on social. Um, oh yeah. You know? And so, in fact, we were throwing a party in New York when the, the shooting of the, uh, the, the news broke and they're like, how could you be posting this? And I'm like, what do you mean? I had no clue. <laughs> Listen, well, anyway, social, um, social media will come after you if you're if you're Mother Teresa for something, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but b- big, big, big picture, I think kind of the things that I'd love to hit on with you guys just as an update because I feel like it's been a year, even though it's only been March since we last recorded. We've got some current and and future distribution updates for you guys. Um, you know, we were on a very ambitious expansion project going essentially nationwide over the course of of two years. Um, we're doing our first ever rebrand. So, you know, even though we're just barely launched in some states, the initial design for Loverboy was is now four years old. So I'll give you guys a little tease as to what kind of Loverboy with a little Botox is going to look like uh, come this fall. Um, and then, you know, don't quote me on this, although I'd love for someone to do the, the homework. We are one of the first brands that I'm aware of, if not the first, of taking wine-based products that are direct to consumer, taking them through the three tiers with beer wholesalers, with a nationwide network of beer wholesalers. Obviously people have done it, you know, in the wine and spirit space, you know, with wine and spirit distributors. Um, I don't know of a brand that's gone to this extent taking a product with this much traction and sales, you know, millions and millions of dollars and going through a distribution network of which will be once it's all said and done with about 240 strong. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a massive undertaking on top of everything else we're doing. But those are the highlights. But, right. you know, you tell me where, where you kind of want to dive in. Well, yeah, Jen, well, I'll let, uh, I'll let J- Jen's closer to the market than I am. I get first firing rights and then uh, Harry can come after. But yeah, no, to your point, Kyle. Um, so how many wholesalers do you guys have now? Like more than tw- 200, right? Or so, oh, you said 240, but I mean, yeah, so we're at 140. Um, and, and by the way, just to put this in perspective, we were at maybe 15 a year ago mm-hmm. and the year before that we were at three. So we're at 140, but we have another hundred to add on okay. to truly be nationwide. And, um, and, and, and you, you, you're with beer wholesalers and you mentioned because 
the benefit of going with beer wholesalers is you get to go a lot deeper into the market. You can hit C stores, you can hit independents. Uh, the problem is, is that you have 240 customers instead of like four. Right. Um, you know, it's it like you said, logistically, it can be a nightmare. And so how have you managed that trade off? Yeah, look, early on, once I, I, I try to educate myself on the industry, I realized, look, it's not going to be taking the easy route because I had an opportunity to go nationwide with, with, with some of the biggest wine and spirit wholesalers. And it would have kind of been like a light switch. I mean, we had a nationwide brand from the get go because of the TV show. But I can't build the next Mark Anthony brands by taking shortcuts. Right. And if you've got a canned product, you're better off with a, with a wholesaler that, that focuses on beer. Right. Um, and I'd much rather be one of the highest, if not the highest margin product um, in a portfolio versus one of the lowest. Right. And you're talking right. just not only percentages, but dollar points. Right. So, you know, that's that's what's incredible for our beer wholesalers. They're getting, you know, a brand with just our teas. Forget the RTDs for a second, but our teas have probably almost double the gross margin on a per case basis. And it costs just as much money to pick up that case from their warehouse and drop it on the floor. And so why not focus on higher margin products? So that's, that's been our strategy from the get-go. A lot of people that don't understand you know, distribution have been asking me why the heck it's taking me to go nationwide so long. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The biggest craft beer brands took 20, 30 years to do what we're doing until. <laughs> sure. So That's will you right. be national by year's end then? Because last time we chatted, you were like in 20 states, I think. Yes, yeah, so last time we chatted, we were in 20. We're now in 40 plus DC. Um, and in conversations to round out, you know, the rest, we might, uh, I think Hawaii might be more like spring of next year and Utah is a, a question mark. But, but that's, yeah, that's the plan to be nationwide by the end of the year. And I feel like last time we chatted, we did, we crunched some numbers and you were like, you had just cracked like the top 30 FMBs in Nielsen. Do you know where you are? Are you guys claiming, climbing the ranks there? Yeah. I mean, I think the last 12 months has been kind of a wild ride, just, just about for everybody. Um, we are, the last time I checked, I think in the twenties, Okay. but that's only with 3.7 ACV. So there's just, we're just scratching the surface. We've been so focused on expansion. Our mindset is now, and our focus is now going to be shifting over to execution. Mm -hmm. We're still a teeny team. We're only 18 people um, in 40 states, right? But, you know, by taking like that harder route of building out a beer distribution network is going to pay off in the long run, right? Like most brands, I think it's something like 3% of beverage brands get the 10 million in sales. We did that in 15 months in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And are you going to blow past that? What, what, what do we say? Million case mark this year, do you think? That might be. I mean, I, I think maybe we could just talk about the state of the industry, right? Like there's been a, a crazy transformation. A million might be wishful thinking, but we do have nationwide chains taking not only our T's through their entire footprint, but now they're RTDs, which is super exciting. I mean, you know, just an initial load in with one chain, you know, we're talking about a million dollars worth of worth of um, liquid. Um, but just to put this in perspective, and, and I'm sure you've heard this, but maybe not quite literally, 12 months ago, I'd say pre kind of July Boston Beer earnings report uh, of last year, our distributors were saying, how many trucks can we order, right? Like how much can you send us? And now, no matter what the data is telling them, their knee jerk reaction is what's your MOQ? And I think that's a testament to just how much has changed. You obviously he had a ton of distributors and retailers get stuck sitting heavy with a ton of mainstream product. And now they went from being super, um, you know, bullish to super conservative. Mm -hmm. Even when you have a brand like Loverboy, where, you have, where we still 12 months later have the highest dollar velocity six pack on the, the Beyond Beer shelf, right? So it's almost like despite all the data, these wholesalers are now saying, prove it. Right. Um, it's, 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 I mean, everybody got so burned last fall, just sitting on a mountain of white cans, basically and yeah. black cans that, uh, yeah, the, the, the mood has changed for sure. And, uh, and you said FOQ or something. It's, MOQ. It, so what is that? Uh, minimum order quantity. Okay. So we, sorry. I'm, I'm a, I'm a little rusty on my acronyms. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's, uh, I mean, one thing that we want to make sure is we, we, we sign agreements that 
that are thinking long term, and so we do have higher MOQs than most brands our size. Um, but but I think that's just like that sentiment isn't just about Loverboy. That's just like I mean I, I heard one of the biggest distributors on the West Coast say they launched White Claw Surge with six pallets, and they covered an entire state. But they know they can just get more. Mm -hmm. right. And I'm like, yo, I I don't have 20 other products on a truck coming to you every week. Yeah, so I thought an MOQ used to be a truckload, but I know not. <laughs> well, that's kind of how we look at things. But um, right. but look, I think the the part of the problem, right, is that you know, and this is no knock. This is pretty much well established, right? The big suppliers that are shooting a shotgun at a bullseye when it comes to innovation. In comparison, we have a laser sight on our consumer. Like we know who they are, where they shop, how they live. We know more detail because we have processed over 100,000 direct-to-consumer orders where we own all the customer data. We analyze that customer data and we have a direct relationship with our customers via email, social, and text. And so I think when you think about what we've done, we've basically done the opposite of what beer has, big beer has done. Right. Like we focus on women. We focus on millennials and Gen Z's. We're, my team is two thirds women. So we understand our consumer way better than big beer. Um, and, you know, what we've done is kind of fly flown in the face of conventional kind of standards where, you know, we have premium price six packs. You know, we didn't do a, a lower margin variety 12. Um, so, it's been an exciting time, but it's been a challenging time, right? We have all the data, but now it's just a little slower for these distributors to kind of welcome us with open arms because they've been so jaded and rubbed the wrong way from a lot of their other partners. Uh, you you talked about your margins a lot, and obviously that's super appealing. Have those taken a hit at all with, you know, rising costs and all, all of that that all your competitors are talking about? Yeah, I mean, I'm proud to say that we have higher margins than Boston Beer, um, and we still do. I mean, we're at some of the same co-pack facilities. Um, but we use better quality ingredients. The ingredients is just a small fraction of the total cost. So for us, it's worth spending more, right? Um, our margins have taken uh, a slight hit, but there was some padding in there because we were over 50% gross margin, um, you know, before all this started. Gotcha. And then at retail, because I know, you know, you've mentioned DTC, you guys do like 25% DTC versus brick and mortar yep. still. Um, is T still driving bus there or are you guys seeing more of like the Cosmo and the Espresso Martini move into so, retail? So T as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. Our sparkly hard teas, that's the only product currently sold through the three tiers. Okay. Um, that's still 75%, right? That's our flagship product. You know, that has just about over $10 of gross margin for our wholesale partners. Um, you know, and that's the product that we look at and explain our wholesale partners as completely 100% incremental their current portfolio. We're bringing in, you know, that wine and spirit consumer. Um, and to this date, when I talk about our brand to, 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 the, to the wholesale market, we are probably the biggest opportunity to get share leakage back from wine and spirits because no other brand appeals to a, a female, you know, millennial Gen Z better than Loverboy. Um, so if, I mean, I think you guys reported that if ABI is reporting that 50% of their Beyond Beer portfolio is incremental, think about what they're selling. I mean, most of that's Bud Light Seltzer, you know, Mick Ultra Seltzer. These are all beer brand extensions. We're bringing in a completely different consumer. Um, you know, and I think even if we're not, you're still making more money per case. <laughs> That said, when are you guys going to get into spirits? Because, right, like everything is high noon, high noon, high noon, right? Right. Yeah, I thought, I actually was pretty fascinated by the story that ran this morning. I forget where, maybe it was you guys, where they actually broke down where the high noon customers coming from. It's still beer. Yeah. It's basically guys that have upgraded from either a light beer or a mainstream hard seltzer. And so, yeah, everyone's right. talking about high noon, but- our consumer, sure, they might be buying high noon, but we're still in a consumer that's buying a way higher priced bottle of, of, of wine or spirits. Um, our RTDs are designed to kind of carry that momentum forward. So if our, if our sparkling hard teas, our premium, you know, high margin products, our RTDs that we're bringing through traditional distribution are ultra, right? So online, they're about $6 per can. 
um, through retail, we're going to give a nice pass a nice little discount onto the consumer and encourage more volume, but it's still going to be anywhere from, you know, $4 to $5 a can. Yeah. Um, but we know we can do it because we've been doing it for years with an average order value online of about $90. Right. Right. And then just one more for me, and then I'll let uh, Harry ask to his heart's content. Um, on-premise, what's the latest with that? I mean, do you guys do any business on-premise? Do you plan to do more business on-premise? Yeah, particularly with you know our distribution footprint getting closer and closer to being kind of locked up. And you know that allows us to shift focus to execution. On-premise represents a huge opportunity for us, particularly with our RTDs. I mean, it's a pain in the butt for a bartender to make four espresso martinis. You know, with our brand, it's just four cracks of a can. Um, and you can charge just about the same amount of money per, per glass. Um, you know, I think Seltzer has always under-indexed on-premise. And I think a lot of that's because why are you going to go to a bar and, and order what you just kind of stocked in your pantry for the entire pandemic? You, you, part of the beauty of going to a bar is that experimental kind of opportunity, that tasting opportunity. So, um that's where I think Loverboy fills a sweet spot. We are a premium brand. We're not mainstream. There's a story. You can feel good about putting it on the, on the shelf behind your bar as opposed to just some mainstream brand with no story. And I think a lot of brand, a lot of bars care about their brand equity and they want to bring in brands that have their own brand equity to offer. Well, one of the things that interests me about this brand is what you mentioned that it's most of your consumers are female. And, you know, I, I think that's maybe not <clears throat> with beer. It's not the consumer, but the buyer is usually female um, off premise at least. And so, uh, you know, everybody's been saying that for 20 years, but it, the beer guys still haven't really, they oh, still yeah. market to men and, right. you know, it, it, and at the point of purchase, it's usually female. So, you know, when you think about your average consumer what is uh you know describe her for me what what's her age what is she doing you know how do you visualize i, I know that that's an amalgam of so many different people but uh sure your well, i think you know big picture the first thing i want to say is you're, you're spot on so 70 percent of off-premise purchases are made by women right. think about that um it's huge so this the industry you know they they, they scratch some of the guys will scratch their head when they look at a brand like Loverboy because they just don't get it. Um, and I can't blame them. They've been selling like, you know, IPAs and, and lagers and light beers for, forever. Um, but, but our consumer is digital first. They're on TikTok. They're on Instagram. Um, they're watching Bravo where I have two TV shows. I mean, Bravo's literally the, num the number one network among women. I I've probably said this before, but I mean, that's our launch pad. That's the differentiator. We have instant like legitimacy among one of the most coveted audiences on TV. Um, you know, and when you think about, you know, the current state of the industry, right? Like I just looked at the last 13 weeks up, up through Labor Day. So I guess that's not the last 13, but the data that I have through Labor Day, you know, beer's down three, hard seltzer's down three, Loverboy's up 122%. Oh. And that's amidst all of these, you know, challenges of, of distributors trying to take enough product just to meet our mandates because they are feeling conservative, right? Um, you know, yeah, is, so is there any way to break out the data though uh, from uh, that coming from new markets versus? Uh, yeah, a lot of that. I mean, when we launched, when we launch a market that we generate a huge splash because we're meeting pent up demand, right? right? And last year, I didn't have the team or the resources to keep the momentum going. So when we launched Chicago, for example, Lakeshore did a phenomenal job. We were the number 12 beer brand, forget beyond beer, number 12 beer brand. I think we we're the number four hard seltzer. I think we we're the number three FMB. I kind of forget the, the numbers at this point, but you know, there's like this tidal wave and then it normalizes. And now, like I said, we're focusing on execution this year because we picked off all of the obvious, you know, mainstream cities. This year we're seeing insane growth in markets that you wouldn't necessarily suspect right so just to kind of give some kudos to some new distributor partners of ours star in connecticut bdi in ohio beer house in kentucky adams and rh behringer in in the carolinas and reyes in south carolina breakthrough nevada hensley in arizona 
all of these are new markets for us and all of them are crushing it. All of them said to me, and I won't say which one in particular, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, Kyle, I, uh, I don't, I don't ever launch new brands at this point with a full truck. And I said, look at the mandates. Cause we have several nationwide chains that need load ins and restocks, but look at the data, look at, you know, I, I want to make sure you maximize, you know, the opportunity here when we make, when we launch and make the splash, they took a full truck 30 days, not even 30 days later, they were ordering their second truck. So, right. so that's, you know, it's a slightly different environment for us because it's a dramatically different environment from beyond beer in comparison to a year ago. But what we're, what we proved is that our brand pulls everywhere. Right. And you know, the repeat buys obviously is the name of the game here in longevity and, and, get, and generating those repeat buys. And when you, you know, when you say, you know, the, the worst thing you can do when launching a product is have an out of stock right after you've launched, you know, right. it, you run out and then the momentum's all gone. Uh, yeah. So it is important to keep them stocked. Uh, when you, um, uh, with these newer products, uh, like you mentioned the espresso martini, that, which I can't wait to try because I'm a, I love espresso martinis. Um, but, uh, do you, do you kind of see that you're going to smooth out a little of the seasonality with those? Because uh, to me, like a hard tea is a summer drink. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so a couple of things, one we have to, to help kind of with some of the seasonality, we have, um, a, a new eight pack variety pack coming out this fall of our teas with some flavors in there that add to the current mix. And kind of there's something for everybody. Um, already last year, we were seeing that, look, tea is the most widely consumed beverage. People do drink it year round. And once people discover, you know, lover boy, they realize, yes, the tea, it is a hard tea, but the tea's there with just like added flavor without the calories. Right. You know, there's plenty of people still drinking some of these lighter, refreshing beverages year round, whether it's light beer, hard seltzer, you name it. But, but I do agree that part of the strategy of taking the RTDs through you know our distribution network is to make sure that we have products that'll crush you know all year round so in addition to the espresso you know we have this we have this cosmo um you know people are ordering espresso martinis and cosmos at the bar you know all days of the year um what what yeah. what would you say to a young entrepreneur who's just now launching their rtd <laughs> don't do it <laughs> um I mean, look, we, we, we're going to market with literally, I don't know the exact number at this point, but well over $5 million of existing DTC sales of our RTDs. It was probably filled 5 million in the last time I spoke to you. So it's probably six or 7 million at this point. We, we have existing customers in 44 states where we can legally sell them. So we have a huge leg up. And so what I would tell an entrepreneur is like, figure out what you're leg up is going to be because you're going to need and it's got you know whether it's the product and it's completely unique and incremental um or you can find a way to um you know launch it online to kind of get proof of concept and product market fit right and i i think i've asked you this before kyle but um how important is the continuation of summer and winter house to the ongoing popularity of the of the brand Look, don't get me wrong. It's been incredible. It's, it's certainly been our cheat code, but I can't tell you how many events we've thrown where the people come up to me and say, I started watching Summer House because of Loverboy. Like we've turned that corner already. We're, we're becoming that mainstream brand where I, I should say a household name, you know, and there's plenty of people drinking it that have no idea who I am. And, and that was really the goal. Now, however, that's not to say I'm not strategic, right? So this is our new, I'm giving you guys the exclusive first look. So this All is, right. just, I'll give you guys an example. So this is uh, the lay flat for our eight pack cool. variety pack. For the fall. Yeah, cool. slightly different um, logo, um, all new packaging. We, we managed to go even louder and bolder than our current packaging. I like that packaging. That's very different. Yeah, back when we did the initial branding, I mean, you said it was literally a sea of white. Other people have caught on. So we right. kind of double down. But what I'm doing with that is incorporating it into filming, right? 
you know, the, the producers want to follow my personal and professional life. Amanda's led the charge on that. Right. And we've talked about it on the show and we're about to get the very first variety pack cans either this week or next. And so we will be drinking these mm -hmm. this summer on camera. And so for people that missed the variety pack launch in the fall, we're going to be talking about it when the show airs next year. And so right. that's how the marketing machine kind of works. It's not just product placement. It's us telling our story. And I think I've said this before, but like, I think the, there's lots of brands that have some type of celebrity attached most of the time, way bigger than me, but there's very few instances where the celebrities actually doing the work. Right. For sure. I mean, we've hey, seen I that time and again. Yeah, I have a follow up there. Did you mention, you know, why eight packs as opposed to six packs or 12 packs? And how are retailers receiving an eight pack, especially for a malt brand? So we ran the, the concept by one of the biggest retailers in the country to make sure we had their buy in. But I mean, I will admit this is taking a page out of, you know, High Noon's book. And it's nothing other than the fact that if we keep that premium price point, if we did a 12 pack, we'd be well over $20. I think that's a pretty big leap for a consumer. There's other premium seltzers out there that are charging 23, 24 bucks. If you've never tried the brand because you can't get your hands on a, on a smaller format, that's a big gamble. So right. for us, the eight pack is about the same price per can as our six packs, which fly as we've talked about. Um, all new flavors, so it's completely incremental. Um, but it isn't a value pack. It is strictly a variety pack. Mm -hmm. And I think that even though I know High Noon has their 12 pack, I think their number one and number two SKUs are actually the eight packs. And it's probably because of that $20 threshold that consumers have to mentally get over. Right. That's yeah. Like sure. dogfish sure. is eight pack. So usually when I think eight pack, I think spirits based to kind of to your point there. So that's uh, interesting. Do you, yeah, do, our, you guys our, run, uh, do, you, do you guys run singles at all? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So most of the innovation, even just the RTDs coming through the three tiers, it's based on what our distributors are asking for. So we had some distributors just be like, look, you absolutely need a 19 too. If you want to play ball, literally in like the arenas and the stadiums and, and right. festivals and events. So we're bringing in three 19 twos through uh, the fall in addition to the variety pack. So our number one seller, which is our white tea peach, Although that's being challenged by our strawberry lemonade. Um, we, we rolled the dice on, you know, some innovation last fall with the orange chai. And now we've kind of steered a little closer towards mainstream with a strawberry lemonade that everybody can kind of wrap their heads around, but it's still, I think that only has one gram of sugar um, and a 19 too. So it's, and then we have a, one of the flavors in the variety packs, a half and half, which is our, you know, now we're taking a direct shot at twisted tea. Right. I mean, basically, if you're drinking a twisted tea, you're just drinking liquid sugar. Um, mm -hmm. our, our half and half has one gram. And um, I know they're targeting us yeah. because I'm, <laughs> I know they're, they're targeting our followers on Instagram. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, hey, smart might, move. Well, might as well shoot back. Yeah. Well, you know, I know that twisted tea has made a big deal about, you know, to the earlier point of seasonality about football, right? About tailgating, that sort of thing. Being that your consumer is more female-based, obviously women watch football too, but is that any sort of occasion you're trying to target? Yeah, I think occasion is the right word here. If you think about our products, we have spritzes too, in addition to the cocktails. So there's three different occasions. We've got the mainstream chuggable, sessionable, sparkling, sparkling hard teas. We have our spritz, which are awesome tasting despite having zero added sugar, no sweeteners, no nothing. It's the cleanest product we make. And then we have these cocktails, which pack a punch at 12% ABV, but still have less than four grams of sugar per serving. And I think the idea here is give a better for you product, something that is better for you than basically everything else out there for these different occasions. You know, yeah, there, you know, you might be at a tailgate with a bunch of guys drinking twisted, but um, maybe that, that consumer that doesn't want to wake up with a gnarly sugar hangover is bringing something different. <laughs> well, I don't know who you're talking about because Biscuit loves having a sugar hangover. She has one right now, <laughs> as you can see. Well, Kyle, uh, that, uh, that is great. Uh, you know, I, I, we've watched you from the very beginning and you are one of the few uh, celebrities that is actively, work, you know, you're running the business. And uh, 
one of the things I think that you taught the industry well, is that you can sell seltzer and not in a white can. <laughs> and I don't, you know, the influence of that, that bold pink can, I don't think you can underestimate because like you said, a lot of people have followed in that direction of um, just sure. going the other way with just uh, bold colors and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, it, it is a bit of a, an innovation. So, uh, you know, we wish you well. And I know that uh, we want to talk to you more about the the summit coming up, right, Jen? Yeah, Jen I was going to put you on the spot and see. Jen, if Jen has big plans for everybody. To January. Oh, yeah. I, I've got all the plans. Yeah, just uh, throwing it out there. Uh, January 8th and 9th at the Breakers. It's not a place that sucks in January. So, yeah, we'd love to have you there on a lifestyle marketing panel or, you know, work something out. Maybe. I mean, that's, I mean, look, Loverboy is a lifestyle brand. We like to describe it as accessible luxury. And I mean, the last thing I'll say is when you think about beer, right? Because the summit is focused on beer. Mm -hmm. We can sell beer in three and a half times more locations than wine and spirits. Mm -hmm. And it's about time beer wholesalers and retailers have accessible luxury lifestyle brands to sell. Like that's been the focus from day one. Mm -hmm. Right, All right. Well, and all, uh, congratulations on your marriage. I forgot. Oh, to yeah. Say. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We follow well, yeah. your socials and uh, look like y'all are y'all had a great time. And what a beautiful bride oh, to be yeah. young again, you know? <laughs> I'm a lucky man. I'm a lucky man. You certainly are, young man, if I may say so. But well, I, I, I be so bold as to suggest. Well, good. Well, uh, we're not going to keep you any longer, but thanks for coming on uh, BeerNet Radio. And uh, we'll hopefully see you in January. And hey, keep in touch. We like Absolutely, to see your yeah. progress. I'll send you guys um, some images of the rebrand, which we're super excited about. If you wanted to tease that, and yep. then um, and then yeah, I, I I challenge you guys. I am actually interested. I I'm trying to figure out if there is another brand that's taken a direct to consumer product that's sold nationwide through a true beer wholesaler network uh, uh, i would say beatbox yeah, yeah beatbox that's, does that they're wine based and uh, i'm pretty sure they're mostly with beer wholesalers yeah they tra uh, they actually transitioned, they transitioned. from yeah, yeah. wine and spirits wholesalers to beer a couple years ago because you can um, that's the other yeah. thing if it's wine based there's no uh usually there's no franchise law right no uh, i'm friendly with those guys it's been in, in so i've just been so impressed with with the last year and well, I mean, they had a huge 2021 and they're having a huge 2022. So I think that just speaks yeah. to people's appetite for, for these products that don't fit the conventional norms from the, from the big guys. Yeah. Good company. Absolutely. Yep. Very aggressive. Very good. They, they remind y'all, y'all, you two remind me of each other, actually. Well, we had a late night in, in Santa Monica. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know we shared an Uber, I think. That <laughs> night. And, uh, all right. Well, great. Well, uh, take care. You guys have a good weekend, and uh, we'll shout at you later. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. Thank you.